at home with Abor's housing economist, Claire Losey. Guys, we're here with another Driving at Home with Dr. Claire Losey. Claire, thanks for hanging out today. Thanks for having me. Let me just offer a warning up front that this might be a little longer of an episode than normal. We feel like there's just been a lot of activity and a lot of there are a lot of questions potentially to answer related to the activity. So we thought we'd just go all in with a, a long tail episode today. Claire, why don't we start with just what is happening? What has happened? Where are we in the world right now? What's going on? So over the past week especially, we've seen a lot of activity in the bond market, especially with the rise of the 10-year Treasury yield. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But essentially, that's been the single biggest difference between last week and, and this week, but just continued mixed signals about whether the Federal Reserve will raise the Fed funds rate again and a lot of mixed reactions within the market. Is that 10-year Treasury yield change directly associated with the downgrading of U.S. debt or are those unrelated activities? So we certainly saw the effect of Fitch ratings downgrading of the U.S. credit rating from AAA to AA plus several weeks ago. And there are still some ramifications from that. But really, the most recent rise in the 10-year Treasury yield has primarily been precipitated by stronger than expected economic data, especially on the retail sales front, as well as a change in investors' expectations that we're going to probably see interest rates remain higher for longer. So that sounds sort of backwards. It sounds like what you just said to me is things are better than we expected. So the response from the 10-year Treasury yield to that is not a positive one. First of all, tell us what the 10-year Treasury yield is, but also why are those not going in the same direction as opposed to conflicting directions? Great question, certainly. So the 10-year Treasury yield is just the expected return on a 10-year Treasury note, which essentially is a debt obligation that's issued by the U.S. government, and it has a face maturity of 10 years upon its initial date of issuance. And it's just the interest rate that an investor would otherwise earn for loaning the government money. And generally speaking, treasuries are one of the perceived to be one of the lowest risk assets. Also known as bonds, right? Or different than a bond. So there's a distinction between treasury bills, notes, and bonds. So bills refer to treasuries that are issued for less than a year. Notes are between one and 10 years. And then bonds are for greater than 10 years. Are longer, long-term projects. So that's why you hear bills, notes, and bonds. Got it. That's the distinction. Okay. And so what this is essentially, the interest rate – the government is willing to pay on someone lending them against their debt. Right. Okay. Right. And that interest rate has lowered or risen? So the 10-year T yield has increased, generally speaking, over the past couple of years because inflation has risen. Mm -hmm. And most recently, especially over the past couple of weeks, the 10-year T yield has increased because the demand for those 10-year T-notes has largely declined. And the reason that the demand for those 10-year T-notes has declined is because investors' perceptions of the economic outlook have actually increased. They're now a little bit more optimistic. They're anticipating that we may actually see the soft landing that the Federal Reserve has been talking about for so long. And so in coupling that with just their expectations for higher than longer rates, essentially what they're seeing is just a somewhat more favorable economic outlook on the one hand, but then a somewhat less favorable economic outlook on the other hand. So is it like as they're scanning, you know, they're looking for places to put their money that's going to create a yield for them or a turn on that money. When they look at the 10-year Treasury note at a time that there's economic instability, the government's willing to pay more interest, and that's a better option. Right. As the economy starts to shift and look better, 
there's potential for a better yield in other investments, more in other types of investments. Right. And the yield on the interest rate the government's willing to pay comes down. Right. And I should be just to be totally succinct here. And that's a simplistic version. <laughs> for sure. And to be very succinct, what we're really talking about here is interest rate risk. Yeah. And so investors' perceptions of interest rate risk have increased, right? And so that's causing them to demand, so to speak, a higher yield. This is riskier. I want to make more money if right. you're going to take mine to if you're, pay your debt. Right. If yeah. we're thinking about it, investors are willing to expend an outlay of cash for 10 years. You know, they're committing to a 10-year debt obligation. And so, therefore, their yield on that obligation should be higher yeah. than it would otherwise be for treasury bills, again. Where you're more liquid and you can pull right. in. And you're not dealing with that fluctuation in interest rates, you know, for one year as you are for 10 years, right? Right, right, right. And so what does this... What does the 10-year T yield, it, what implication does it have overall on our perception of the economy and more directly for our membership on the mortgage interest rate? Great question. So broadly speaking, the 10-year T yield, it's used as kind of the benchmark rate for a lot of other investments, a lot of other assets, including the mortgage rate. And so historically speaking, Mortgage rates have exceeded the 10-year T yield to the tune of about 180 basis points. And the reason for that spread is that, generally speaking, mortgages are a little bit more risky than 10-year Treasury notes. There's more credit risk involved with mortgages, i.e. the potential that a borrower could default. So investors require just a a higher return on mortgages than they otherwise would for 10-year Treasury yields. But what we've seen over the past year or so now is that spread between mortgage rates and the 10-year T yield has actually increased. Mm. And right now it's hovering around 300 basis points, which is three percentage points. Mm -hmm. And what that is indicating to us is that mortgage lenders and the secondary mortgage market, broadly speaking, really perceive higher prepayment risk, higher credit risk, and then just this duration adjustment, duration risk. And so when we're talking about prepayment risk, what we're really referring to here is just the fact that, broadly speaking, we know that interest rates are probably bound to change. They could go up slightly, They may moderate somewhat over the next year, you know, into 2024 if the Federal Reserve decides to cut rates. But we know, broadly speaking, again, that interest rates are going to fluctuate over the near term. Mm -hmm. And what that means is that a mortgage lender who is originating a mortgage today is at higher risk to lose money either way. They would, if interest rates increase, they're losing money on the rate that they the higher rate they otherwise could have charged. But if interest rates decrease, if the Federal Reserve cuts the federal funds rate, then they are not able to their the likelihood of a bar refinancing increases. Yeah. And so they're not going to be able to incur the return on that higher interest rate for very long, right? We're anticipating the Federal Reserve would cut rates into 2024, 2025, mortgages are generally 30-year, you know, they're long-term assets. So the lender's only going to be paid that higher rate potentially for a year or two years before we, they before borrowers refinance. Yeah. So one thing that comes to mind is like the idea of a penalty associated with an early payment. Do you think that we'll start to see more penalty clauses built into lending right now? Right. That would be one way for a lender to offset. To mitigate that. Right. To kind of mitigate this kind of interest rate risk, you know, the prepayment. Which is just, I mean, from an agent's perspective, you want to work with a lender that you trust and that is going to very clearly communicate to the client if or when those penalties exist so that nobody feels locked into a situation that they were unaware of. Right. And we want to be clear here, too, though, that... As a as an agent working with a client, your client, generally speaking, is going to be better positioned to not have that penalty, right? To have the flexibility 
in freedom to be able they to generally refinance. prefer. Yeah, I mean, right. of course, the consumer prefers that. But I think what we might see is a response and you know, discount on the rate, right? But then a penalty locks you, can you in. A prepayment, right, right, penalty, right, right. And so, just really, the headline in terms of an agent on this is working with a lender that you trust again and clear communication on all sides. Right. So the prepayment risk is one of the risks associated with mortgage lending, but the duration and credit risks exist also. Talk about those a little bit. So generally speaking, with credit risk, we're referring just to the creditworthiness of the borrower Mm -hmm. themselves and just the probability that the borrower could default on the mortgage. And while consumers remain generally well-positioned, we've seen very resilient consumer spending despite high inflation, there is still this concern that should we experience somewhat of an economic setback or should inflation kind of catch up, so to speak, to the average consumer, that we could see the default rate, the mortgage default rate increase. So that's really what we're talking about with credit risk. And then with duration risk, we know, generally speaking, that Of course, it's dependent, but mortgages, while they're a 30-year generally fixed rate asset, typically the borrower only holds on to that mortgage for a duration of actually under 10 years, less than 10 years. So they're typically of shorter duration than 10-year treasury notes themselves. And so what's going to happen is that the pricing of the mortgage rate is actually probably more so going to resemble the rate on seven-year treasury securities because that that rate tends to be a little bit lower than a 10-year T-yield. However, we've seen this inversion and the rate on seven-year treasury securities is actually higher than the rate on 10-year treasury securities. So that's why we've also seen this uptick in mortgage rates themselves, because lenders, again, are pricing them based off seven-year treasury securities and just given that higher differential between seven-year and and 10-year treasuries, we've seen some of this uptick in rates. So, you know, obviously our agents are keenly aware of the fact that we've hit a mortgage rate in excess of what we've seen over the last 20 years at this point, which feels you know, frustrating and harmful potentially to their business. What do we anticipate the housing market's response is to this? How are, you know, obviously buyers are impacted every time the rates increase and it impacts directly their buying power. And maybe more broadly, do you expect that they're going to stay at this rate or increase or decrease? I or think... is our crystal ball feeling fuzzier than normal right now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I need to call my bluff on my crystal ball. Oh, it hasn't well. been. <laughs> it's not you. Been it's the this best. world we live in. <laughs> well, I would say that right now, kind of over the near term, over the next month, two months, et cetera, the probability that mortgage rates are going to moderate, you know, are going to decline is fairly low. We may see a little bit of fluctuation, you know, Right now, last week, we were hovering at about 7.09%. So we may see a little bit of fluctuation down to the high six range or whatnot, but we're not anticipating that there's going to be any broad, you know, 50 basis point Mm -hmm. downward movement. Right now, the exposure is more so on the upside, the probability that mortgage rates could actually continue to increase. And this is largely going to be dependent on the bond market's reaction to the Federal Reserve's Jackson Hole meeting, which is going to be happening this week. It actually starts today. And so as the Federal Reserve begins to convey more information in anticipation of their September meeting about the direction of the Fed funds rate, that's really going to affect, again, investors in the bond market's perception of where the economy is heading, and that's directly going to impact the 10-year Treasury yield. So it's a little bit too soon quite to tell what's going to happen to rates. But again, there is higher exposure um, to that upside risk of rates increasing. And understanding that as rates rise, we could generally expect that prices will need to moderate you know, so that we're creating housing that's accessible and desirable to the buyers in the market. 
But pairing that in this market with a lack of inventory, a still very high demand, I mean, how do we anticipate what happens with housing in Austin? So I think right now what we're going to see, it, and what we, I should back up, what we have seen over the past year plus now coincident with a higher rate environment is an uptick in mm-hmm. active listings. Mm-hmm. So I think actually what we're going to see now is a little bit of a retrenchment in kind of that new listing activity. So we're going to probably see that active listings remain more stagnant. And so I actually think that inventory could moderate somewhat, right? We've seen this rise in the months of inventory over the past several months, which has been a good thing, a much needed Mm -hmm. boost to our housing market. We're now hovering um, between about three and a half and four months of inventory, at least as of July of this year. But this, you know, just this idea that months of inventory could moderate a little bit, which would help to offset some of the moderation in sales activity that we could expect, right, from this higher rate environment. And the Fed will meet when again? So its next meeting is in September, but they're meeting in Jackson Hole. There's just this oh, how annual. <laughs> a little retreat of sorts so that they can sort out where the economy might be headed. Yes, yeah, so they can have a lovely spa day. That's and... excellent. <laughs> Hop on a horse and tell us what's going to happen this fall. You know, they're trying to live out their best Yellowstone lives. Oh, my God. But right. So they're meeting in Jackson Hole. It's their annual symposium that starts today. But the next meeting in which they'll be potentially announcing another rate hike will be in mid to late September. And the symposium, is it publicly broadcasted in such a way that the markets might react? Exactly. Yeah. So there's going to be a pretty instantaneous response. Potential for some volatility. Right. As we see what happens. Right. And that won't really, (laughs) exactly. And that won't really trickle into mortgage rates until next week. Right. Because the way, you know, Freddie Mac, they release their average rate on Thursdays. Okay. So the average rate for the week is coming out today. Okay. So we won't really see the effects of what Fed Chair Powell says or, you know, whatnot, how markets are reacting until next week. Yeah. And my understanding just from folks in the market, here locally at least, is that we're up closer to 8% at this point on the mortgage rate index. Right. And two, part of that is just lenders' expectations, right? So if mortgage lenders are- They're forecasting into the fog, essentially. They're baking, potentially baking in that rate hike, whether we see it or not, you know, they're baking that in to, to rates right now. Because again, as we were talking about earlier- their risk exposure is higher right now. Mm -hmm. And they don't want to risk locking in a borrower right now at a lower rate when next month rates could be, you know, a couple 25 basis points higher, you know, whatnot. So they want to, they're trying to anticipate, they're trying to derive, you know, expected future Mm -hmm. earnings that they otherwise would have made had they waited until next month or October to originate the mortgage. Yeah. And so you and I were chatting before we started today a little bit about some of the advocacy efforts that we're seeing from Lawrence Yoon, the chief economist of the National Association of Realtors, related to his call on the Fed to not raise those rates. I mean, his, his post is referred to in LinkedIn, which we'll put in the notes of this episode, pretty clearly says, please stop. I mean, is that the concise version of what he's calling for? Absolutely. It's certainly a directive. It's more so of a a command. A call and (laughs) command, perhaps. And, you know, to be determined. But good to see advocates and and staff at the National Association of Realtors working towards, you know, calling on economic stability, but doing it in a way that doesn't completely harm or threaten the housing market as well, as that has such a broad economic impact. Right. And we have to remember that the housing market is the most interest rate sensitive sector in the broader economy. We feel the volatility the most. Right. And of course, we are acutely concerned with affordability, especially here in Austin. You know, that's a factor for concern with the National Association of Realtors, but especially here in Austin, Mm -hmm. where we know that, you know, the, the growth in home prices has significantly outpaced the growth in income, even over, you know, the past year and a half now, as we've seen higher mortgage rates. So broadly speaking, you know, the affordability constraints are a significant concern with these higher rates. 
And so Lawrence Yun's, you know, call to the Federal Reserve to stop its rate hikes is primarily driven by yeah. that. Yeah. Okay. Well, we will be back with more conversation on this. I would say, you know, to members who are listening who have offered us feedback, please continue to tell us, you know, what level of detail is helpful to you on this. We're certainly happy to be having these conversations about these major shifts in the economy at a national level, at a local level, but we want to have them in a way that, like, helps you guys on the ground. So, Claire, thanks so much for for hanging out on an extended episode today. Guys, hang in there. We'll see what happens with the mortgage rates, but you're still selling an incredibly valuable asset and an incredibly valuable investment over the long term. It is a wealth building asset in a community that is highly desirable. So, you know, keep your chin up, agents. We want you guys to keep rocking. We'll see you soon. Thanks, guys. Take care.